I think for a product library, really kind of make it personal to you and then really use the resources out there, the digital sample libraries, material bank, those types of things where you can source the materials, get them in, present them, hold on to them until the project's done, and then get rid of them. Today, we're talking all about digital product libraries for your interior design firm with the fabulous and amazing Rex Rogosh. Have you hit a wall when it comes to growing your business? Then welcome to the Wingnut Social Podcast, helping home professionals and luxury brands accelerate their success with proven marketing strategies and expert industry practices. Now, here's your host, Darla Powell. This podcast is brought to you by Wingnut Social, a digital marketing agency amplifying luxury brands across the U.S. and Canada, eh? For more information, go to wingnutsocial.com or give us a call at one 877 Wingnut. Hey there, and thank you for tuning in to the Wingnut Social Podcast. I'm your host, Darla Powell. I am an interior designer in Miami, Florida, and have the interior design firm. Strangely enough, it's named Darla Powell Interiors, and I am also the CEO, the Chief Visionary Officer, the Grand High Poobah, the Head Muckety Muck at Wingnut Social, which is a social media marketing agency for luxury brands. One of our verticals just happened to be, wait for it, interior design. Imagine that. So today on the show, we have Rex Rogosh, who is the creative director for Darla Powell Interiors, who is stepping in based on a Facebook community group post about keeping a digital product library for your interior design firm. He has some thoughts on that. And thanks again, Rex, for subbing in last minute for some calendar switches on the uh, guest situation here on the podcast. So today's interview is going to be really short and sweet. But before we talk to the amazing and well-loved, world-renowned Rex Rogosh. You know what time it is. Mini News Sash. It's time for Mini News. Mini News Sash. Yeah. yeah. All right. Fresh back from her dream vacation in social media marketing world at Wingnut Social is social media manager Hallie Zimmerman with some Mini News. What we got today, Hallie? Many news, yes. So we're talking to you today. We're giving you some tips that are going to help you maximize your video reach on Facebook. Facebook just recently gave us a little bit more information that we can use when we're planning our video. So that's what we're talking to you about today. The interesting thing is, of course, all this will come back to the mysterious, mystical Facebook algorithm, right? Do we even know what it is and how it works? Do, <laughs> Do we? We? <laughs> we, have, we have some ideas, though, right? As a, as a oh, marketing sure, agency. Yeah. But yeah, no, they hold their cards close to the vest. They don't really like to tell us a lot. So we have to put a lot of elbow grease in there to figure that out. So video on Facebook is super impactful, right? Video does incredibly well on Facebook. So I'm thinking that any tips that you might have here would be... Super helpful. And what are they? We do actually know about the Facebook algorithm. We joke there. Um, And it's interesting, right? You're right. Video is very popular on Facebook. And most of the time we're thinking these days, since it's Facebook is such an ad-based powerhouse platform, we think, oh, we've got to pay to play. And that is true, I will say to some extent. But video can really help you, right? Especially maybe if it's boosted. But we want to help you with video here. The first things to note about Facebook's video algorithm is that they are looking for content that is engaging, that they're looking for content that people will sit and watch, and they're looking for content that people will share. So those are key things that you're going to want to keep in mind. So how do they know if a video is engaging? Is there like some little Facebook person sitting back there watching everyone's videos? Do we know? Uh, well, there very well could be. What we do know (laughs) is you can, you can, you know, that's what actually, this is how I'm going to think of this. I want to picture that because it's more fun. Uh, But you can think about the algorithm as a matching system of sorts. It basically takes in users' interactions, the pages they like, things that they're sharing, what they're saying. You know, we say it's kind of creepy, but it basically learns its users because the whole point is that they're wanting to create customized news feeds that are personalized to you, that are going to deliver content that you're going to like, you're going to engage with, you want to share and, well, you know, keep you on the platform and having a good time there. So there is that. So that's kind of how it works. Okay, so here you have four key tips to maximizing your video performance. Number one, and go. You're going to want to create videos that drive intentional and loyal video watching. And for example, this could be creating stories that connect with people emotionally, creating videos about that and sharing it. It's also about creating like series type videos, right? Something that people are going to keep coming back to and they're going to find value in and they want to come and see what you have next. The second one is creating videos that build a meaningful interactions and drive authentic sharing. So I think 
you know, we get hung up sometimes when we're creating content on things being, oh, it's got to be entertaining and informative and, you know, evoke emotion. And those things are all there. And that is true. But the other part that I think people miss sometimes when they're creating video is that they're not first thinking, why would somebody want to share this piece of content? What is going to drive them to engage with it? Why would they like this? You know, I think we get caught up on these crazy, you know, some ideas that we're like, we want to do this because people will like it. But you got to really think deeply about why they would and why they would share it. Um, because shareability for video content is huge. All you want to think about a lot of times or keep in mind always is, you know, will people want to share this and click that share button because one person shares, it goes to their followers and expands from there. And then so on and then so on. Remember that shampoo commercial back in the day? You're too young to remember that. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I, don't, I, I wash my hair every day, so <laughs> do you really? <laughs> Most days. Oh, okay. That's odd, yeah. right? Yeah, it, it doesn't Very dry. Strange. That doesn't dry out your hair. It dries out my hair if I wash it every day. But it's this Florida humidity, I guess. It does other <laughs> things, but it keeps it, it keeps Squirrel. it nice, I suppose. Squirrel. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Next tip. Next tip. Squirrels, right? Include those in your video. That's next. No, I'm just kidding. I will uh, always watch a good squirrel video. That's a great, right. That's a great tip. Bonus tip. Viral. It'll go viral. Put a squirrel in it. We're just kidding. That's a joke. Your next tip here is creating longer, high quality video pieces that are going to keep people watching. Okay. So Facebook is good for long form video. And when we say long form, we mean content that is two to 10 minutes in length. And Facebook has specifically said what they're looking for is let's take a three minute long video, for example. If in that first 60 seconds, people will like it, leave a comment, share it, or they're watching it. They're saying, hey, people like this, and we're going to help get it in the algorithm. We're going to help get it out to people. So you're also looking for that. And uh, the last thing that we want to tell you that we've talked about a lot recently is creating original content. We know that that's huge. We've talked about it a lot, especially now with Instagram, you know, restricting the distribution of video reels that have been recycled from other platforms. Right. We recently talked about that. So Facebook also wants you to create original content just like Instagram does on each platform because it's valuable, right? If they, if users can only see it, only get it on that one platform, um, it will keep them there. Again, it's valuable. It's worth their time. So, you know, one of our main tips also is to go ahead and create original content. Okay, Holly. So the first 60 seconds sounds pretty critical. It's like that uh, golden hour. <laughs> <laughs> if you're an emergency service work worker to get someone right. to the emergency room to save their life, right? So it's the first, right. it's the 60 seconds, the golden minute to get that engagement and to get those likes for your video to get the traction. What do you recommend for someone to do on their video to make that happen? So we do know that video watch time right at the beginning of a video, it goes up and down, but it's literally anywhere from two, three, five seconds. I mean, you got to grab them quick. And what I would recommend is some really great, quick, catchy video editing. I think if you can slice the video quickly and do, you know, throw up something quick, something interesting, like a, like a beautiful shot of something, um, you're changing the video editing quickly in the beginning in the first five seconds, you know, I think people will say, oh, this looks exciting. I'll stop and watch a little longer. And if you can at least stop them there, then that might get them in the video a little bit while they're sit there and maybe get a minute in. But of course, you know, that that's a tricky thing as well. And also, I will add this other note about video. We've been seeing this a while. And we know it's important for accessibility reasons, but uh, captioning is, is huge, right? We've seen this stat forever. And, it, and it's true that most people, 80% uh, of people watch video without sound. A lot of people are watching video without sound. Whatever the number is these days, it's still happening. So, you know, maybe having captions on, if you've got that going for you and you've done some, some quick video slicing and editing right at the beginning, some quick boom, 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 something to grab their attention. You just might kind of hang them for hang on to them a little longer, you know? I love that you said that about the captions because that is how I watch most of my video. I don't like the sound on it. I like to read and see the video at the same time. That's just, it's not even because I'm not trying to annoy people near me. That's just something I like to do. There are the rare few that are just like you, but a lot of people are on, you know, they're on subways, they're uh, sitting, waiting places, and they can't have sound on, but they're still scrolling through their phones. So uh, our best recommendation would be turn those captions on too. That will help. I love it. Hallie, thank you again for some amazing tips to get your Facebook videos up to snuff and to get that traction and reach and not bore the <laughs> out of people. So, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next week and I'll see you later at the Wingnut Social Salt Mines. Thank you. <laughs> All right, bye bye. Mini new sash. Yeah. yeah.
All right, guys. Now let's get into my interview with Rex Rogosh. You might remember Rex from his episode, his previous episode on hospitality on the Wingnut Social podcast. Rex Rogosh, episode 190, is not only an amazing human being, but he's also the creative director of my interior design firm, Darla Powell Interiors. And without him, I would be lost in the sauce because when we came up on video here for the podcast, he was like, wait, who are you? (laughs) (laughs) you seem familiar i think i've seen you before can't quite place you yeah so yeah he's pretty much running the show over there at darla palantiris and i appreciate him so much rex rogosh how the hell are you i'm well how are you i'm i'm doing really well you look a little tired from your weekend performances little known fact about rex can i say this rex absolutely okay so rex has an alter ego a drag persona called anorexia and he does do some uh, events on the weekends and he's amazing he's an award-winning drag performer right am i saying that correctly uh, i am a title holder yes a, a title i have a title like to my car my house does that count <laughs> <laughs> does it come with a tiara or a crown it, it does if i want it to all right so what spurred this podcast interview to have rex back because he's so incredibly knowledgeable is we were in a facebook group and someone asked a question about what rex and then we'll take it from there so yeah so um on facebook through one of the groups that we are part of someone was asking about product libraries and how to organize them do we really need them and i chimed in Because that was something that I've done quite often in some of the larger firms I worked at was keep our product libraries organized because it is quite a task. So there's uh, a lot of tips and questions around it that I still had. And people were like, oh, let's make this an open conversation. So it was too much to type. So now we're here. (laughs) I know. I know you're like, let's do a podcast on this. And I'm like, okay, sure, let's do it. Because (laughs) the guest that I had actually rescheduled. So guess what, Rex, you're it. Okay, so let's talk about in this age right now, especially with COVID going on for the past year and everybody's working remotely from home, let's talk about building a product library digitally. Is it feasible? Do we still need to have and hold uh, the physical stuff in our hands and how do we organize it? Well, that was a really good question uh, posed by one of the people in in the group. And my first thought is, well, if you're doing everything remotely, then technically you don't need a product library. Now, as designers, we're always wanting to touch and feel and and look at the textures of fabrics and, and tile. So for us personally, I think it's still pretty important. But as far as presenting to clients, I mean, if you can do it digitally, uh, doing a digital version of a board can be a little time consuming, but can be just as effective as, you know, a regular lay. I think you have to know your clientele and know how you work and then be able to utilize the resources out there for you to gain samples, give back samples, Uh, because having a product library can uh, take up a lot of room that probably isn't necessary anymore. Yeah. And then you have to pay for an intern or someone to come in and clean it out and update it. I mean, I How much, I mean, are you finding that when we're going and when we're doing presentations, which we're doing a lot of them digitally now too, people are missing that aspect of it or are the clients on board with just moving forward and trusting that the tactile experience from your experience? I think on some materials and some um, items, they're okay digitally. I think still with fabrics and sometimes with tiles and stone, uh, maybe wallpapers, they're looking for the physical sample. Uh, what we've been able to do is present it digitally first and making sure that we have high-res images of what we're presenting, which you can get from pretty much any of the vendor's websites nowadays or call your reps. And if the client then signs off on the direction that we've presented to them, we go, okay, we will send you physical samples or be able to, because we've already made the presentation. And now that we, you know, now that they've said, yes, we like the direction I can send the samples. And I think it's really important now more than ever. I mean, I was always a very independent person and didn't really utilize my reps the way I should. And so now I'm finding that the reps are actually very beneficial because you can call them up and say, I need these samples sent directly to my client and they'll send the samples. They'll also send return envelopes, especially for a lot of the fabric companies. You can then return the samples right back to the companies, which I think is very important, not only from an ecological standpoint, but also just a space. I mean, who wants to house 400 pieces of fabric? You and I are still working remotely in my office here. You know, there's no room to keep on. I was doing that in the beginning. I had all kinds of fabric samples and tiles and it was driving me crazy. And I was throwing them out half the time because it's just, there was no, it's like, I don't have a big enough space to have a really well-rounded material bank 
right? So digitally just made a whole hell of a lot more sense for me. And there's a lot of people in the audience who are doing that still. They're working remotely or working from home who don't have a showroom or an office to do that. And I really, really do like the labor saving costs of it. And then the fact that, like you just said, all you have to do really is if you have a client that likes the direction, right? So there might be a little bit of an extra step there is just to reach out to the vendors and they're super quick about getting you samples because that is what they do. So is there a difference? Like, is there an, a, a particular genre of interior design someone's working, maybe commercial versus residential or a particular type of residential where you might change your opinion where it is more important to keep a physical bank in their showroom or, or firm? Well, I mean, when I worked commercial and large firms, we always had Hundreds of square feet dedicated to a library and usually two to three people who, who are always <laughs> working in that library to keep it up to date, keep it clean, keep it organized. I would find that I would go down to the libraries to get inspiration and to get a, get a beginning direction. The majority of my design then in between was ordering new stuff and ordering new samples and, and creating something. And then I would go back down to the library if I needed a last minute, like, the client didn't like something, so I needed to change something out last minute. So for me, it was always a beginning and an end tool. It was never really the middle tool. Okay. And I think as a designer, you have to figure out kind of how you work, right? And how quickly you have to work. If you're always turning over projects at a very high rate and you're not near a product library or you're not near a design center, you know, a product library would be very beneficial for you. Unfortunately, they take up a lot of room. And <laughs> I find that designers will then get stuck in a, I'm always going to use this fabric. I'm always going to use this tile because it's in their library and it's very comfortable for them to just go always and grab it. So I think that's a downside to having them is you get comfortable and always picking the same things and you're not always pushing yourself and seeing what's out, what's new out there, especially if you're a single designer. I was actually even fine in my limited experience with the the materials that I had here in my home office. I was kind of doing the same thing. Like, oh, this is here. It's very, you get a little bit lazy, a little complacent with some of the material instead of going out and being more adventurous. So coming to that now, since we are sourcing digitally and getting, you know, the the process that you did mention, how are you, you can't walk into a, a design library now to get inspiration. Are you just surfing the web or where's, where's that stemming from now? I know you're seeing stuff in your head on site. Um, a lot of it's coming from actually when we talk to the clients, cause we don't really source or put anything together until we have a, a debriefing with the client and they show us their inspiration pictures. So once I see what their inspiration pictures are, I'm, I'm, I'm taking reference from that. You know, obviously I have kind of my own ideas of what I wanted the space to look like or what I thought the space would look like based on the first, you know, interaction with them. But once we have the debriefing, we start picking up on key. You know, if I start seeing a bunch of pictures and everything in, in there's blue in every picture or there's limestone <laughs> yeah. in every picture. So that's where we really kind of get, uh, get those and then, you know, taking those notes and then taking from that and then building upon, you know, as designers, we always take from our own personal history, our own past projects, but it's really nice seeing the inspiration because from someone else, because they might be pictures and there might be images that you've never seen before or that you've never really had interaction with. So that would then kind of make the creative juices flow a little bit and you start pulling, oh, I loved the ceiling from this picture and, you know, whatever it, whatever it was. Right. And then start, go out and try to start finding those materials that match the inspirations picture. So full digital sourcing, really. I know how we're organizing. I'm playing devil's advocate here too for the audience too. But how are we organizing these resources, this digital online uh, material bank, so to speak? Really, it lives in each project. I haven't really looked at putting together a mass, like here's all, all these images of stone. and Because then you're falling right back into that kind of headache and situation where of having a physical library, right? If you start archiving all these photos within a regular library, then you're going to run right back at that. Well, let me go into my library and da, 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 da. For us, it's really we're, we're accumulating the items and the materials that we need. They live specifically in a project. So if I ever have to refer to a past project or go, you know, when we're talking to, you know, some of the other designers or clients, I can go, oh, let's refer to this project and we'll go pull it from that project. But not capturing it in a mass library still allows me to have a little bit of freedom creatively so that I'm not relying on, on something. And with a quick Google search, and if you know how to do reverse lookup with photos through Google, so finding stuff digitally is actually pretty quick if you're specific and you know what you're looking for and you don't fall down the rabbit hole. 
How much do you think the not being able to attend trade shows like High Point Market and actually go and lay your hands on stuff physically? Because that is one of the things that those markets are important for to help us as interior designers to say, listen, I sat my butt in the sofa. I put my hands on it, Mr. Client. Trust me when I tell you this stuff is amazing. How much has that affected you in your sourcing? Has it been long enough to show a detriment in that? that you know what I'm saying? To convey that confidence to the client for the materials that we're sourcing for them? At the moment, no, because the sources that uh, we're using, especially for upholstery goods and whatnot, are sources that I've been using for years. For you, we have the experience with it. So I already had the experience with yeah. it, correct. Uh, not only just seeing it, but also have multiple clients over the years using it. But a lot of the new sources that we're dealing with are mostly case goods. So, you know, a wood dresser is a wood dresser for the most part. <laughs> yeah. There are different, definitely different qualities and in, in, in spectrums and that. Not going to trade shows. I, the funny thing is, is I never was a big trade show person. Are you struggling with your social media? Do you have a strategy? Or are you just throwing things up, praying to the social media gods that your images and your captions are attracting your ideal client? Well, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be calling Wingnut Social and getting your social media audit and strategy. Our process begins with an in-depth boarding call. And then we write you a custom strategy curated just for your business to determine your end game, your goals, your ROI, what is it that you really want to get out of social? You don't just want to throw pretty pictures up. You want it to actually pay off, I'm thinking, right? So let's get specific. Here are a few insights your strategy will include. Competitive analysis, current performance, positioning, who are you online, your voice, your aesthetic, content pillars, what the heck to post about, Plus, tips for stories, video, hashtags, captions, way to engage with your followers, and how to get those ever-changing algorithms to work in your favor. So if you need help with your social media marketing, and you just need a strategy and just need a business plan in some direction to get some real ROI and get clients picking up the phone to call you, head on over to wingnutsocial.com and check out. You can actually purchase it directly on the website. That's wingnutsocial.com. Or one eight seven seven wingnut. You're going. You're going to fall market. By the way, just to let you know. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I would. I use trade shows when I needed to find new product. Yeah. So I would always, and I and I was very upfront with a lot of my vendors that way. You know, I grew up using digital. So for okay. me, computers have always been part of my life. So I'm very comfortable with digital catalogs and 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 those types of things. So for me, if I needed to find, say, one year I needed children's furniture, I, I, had, I did not have the resources for that. So I specifically went to market, had looked up all of the vendors that carried children's furniture, and I only went to those vendors first. If I had time to go visit some of my existing vendors just to see what was new or see what was coming, I would. Only because I would also get 15 emails a day from all my existing vendors, the catalogs and everything. So I've, I had already seen all the new product. And... Because I already knew the quality from that vendor, I didn't feel like I needed to go check up on them again. So I'm a little bit different in that way. I think a lot, there's a lot of designers that love to touch and feel everything. Yeah. So I think it really is you have to find your own comfort zone. And there are going to be some designers, some companies that are going to be very comfortable moving into a digital platform with things across the board. And there's going to be some that are not. I think, unfortunately, eventually you're, we're going to have to. You're going to see the decline of paper catalogs. You're mm -hmm. going to see the decline of paper price lists and those types of things because we're, we're moving even in the fabric world. I'm seeing they're not stocking stuff as much. They're printing the fabric as you order it. They So the amount of product that they can now carry is tripling because they're not stocking it. So that makes up having a library even more difficult. I will say there, there's listening to you talk about everything being digital and having to get used to it. I'm, a part of me is a little sad about it because I did love going to presentations with my little box with my metals and my woods and my fabrics and stuff. There's like a like an old school kind of romanticism, you know, to present that. It, it, that's, I guess it's going the way of the hand rendering. <laughs> I think in a residential sense, I think you're still going to see that because I think with a residential design, 
again, you're dealing with someone's personal space. So that type of presentation makes it more personal, right? And we're trying to do that in a digital sense as well. You know, when we do our digital presentations, we definitely make sure it's on Zoom. We can see their faces. Right. Um, we still have that somewhat personal interaction. And I think more people are, uh, especially now that people are working from home, they are getting more used to that. But on the se- on the flip side, because they're working from home, it seems like their schedules are getting more tight and tight and tight. So the amount of time that we get to spend with somebody is becoming less and less. Would I love to, I mean, I used to love to lay out all the fabrics and everything on the table and have somebody come in and let them fall in love with it. Absolutely. I do miss that interaction. And in some ways, you know, I think we can still, we're still trying to do that. You know, there's still certain things that we're doing where it's personal. In fact, you know, like today we're going um, to be with someone to start designing their kitchen and we're physically doing it in the showroom. We're not doing it virtually because I think there's certain aspects of home design that you still need to get that personal interaction because it's something that they do on a regular basis. Yeah. I think with commercial, it's a little easier. It's, a, you know, commercial design is a little bit easier to do it more digitally because sometimes at the end of the day, it's more about budget and not necessarily about how the fabric feels. <laughs> yeah. And doing it maybe a hundred, a hundred of those <laughs> instead Correct. of, yeah, just like you know, a few yards. Yeah. It's not as intimate. Correct. But I mean, I would suggest to any designer, no matter commercial, residential, whatever you're doing, hospitality, if you want a library, make the library more about your favorite things. Okay. And what inspires you, you know, believe it or not, I've even used my own closet. I designed an entire uh, color scheme around my, one of my favorite shirts. And my boss thought it was crazy and it, it worked. So I think for a product library, really kind of make it personal to you, some of your favorite go-to items that you can use for inspiration, and then really use the resources out there, the digital sample libraries, material bank, those types of things where you can source the materials, get them in, present them, hold on to them until the project's done, and then get rid of them. I was just going to ask you about material bank. Do we have an account with them at Darla Palantirs? I I thought we looked into that back in the... I'm not sure. I mean, it's one of those resources that I have not, I've, I was a part of, but I never really got into it. I felt that a lot of the resources that were in there were not tailored to the clientele that I was working on. Okay. Yeah. I've heard nothing but good things about it. A lot of people do recommend it. So um, if yeah. you are looking for something to source stuff from Material Bank, that's materialbank.com, no affiliation there or anything. So it's one of the resources. I'm sure if you Google it, you can find several resources, but um, we haven't really needed it though, is what you're saying, because the vendors have been pretty responsive. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So for the diehards in the audience who still want to have a physical library, and by the way, I don't know if I mentioned it, but we use my Doma which is the software to organize all of our projects in there, which you were referring to before about it living in the projects digitally. So the diehards that still want to have a physical library out there to keep it from going stale, to keep it up to date, and how the hell do you organize it without it being a mess? So this is something that I used to do a lot just because I think t- you know time is money. So having a disorganized library means you're spending more time trying to hunt for stuff than you should be and not enough time in the design world. So really you need to think about, one, how large is this library? So for instance, in a lot of the commercial spaces, we would have very specific sections where tile would live here, glass lives here, fabric lives here, those types of things. And then we would subset it and break it down from there. Fabrics, I think, are the biggest headache, probably for most designers, regardless if you're doing commercial or residential. One, you always end up with millions of fabric samples. Yeah. And so how how do we how do we organize it? I personally do very much like a library. I, I organize it in two different ways. First, I've organized by vendor. The reason for that is is you you know some vendors are high end, some are me- medium, some are low end. You know some vendors you always have back orders, some you get really, you know, great response from. So vendor is always the first for me. And then second is always by color. And the reason why I do by color is because as designers, a lot of times when we're starting design, that's some of the first questions that we ask it is what is our color scheme? So if I have all of my red fabrics together, I can at least go in there and go, okay, I'm looking for a red upholstery fabric, but at least I'm in red instead of going through and trying to find an upholstery fabric and then try to find a red. Right. Because you might have like 17 upholstery red fabrics from this vendor. So that's what, that was always my key is by vendor than by color. Okay. I would do that with pretty much any material. My wallpapers were the same way. I had all my wood wallpapers together. I had all, and the nice thing about that is sometimes, you know, like I would have a folder wallpaper, for example, and it had all my wood wallpapers in it. Well, there might be 20 different vendors in there. So for me, 
it was a way of maybe going, oh, I forgot that that vendor had that. Maybe I should explore more with that one. Because again, I think as designers, sometimes we get very complacent with the v vendors that we work with, especially when you, you decide you're going to have a million accounts and then all of a sudden you're only using these three accounts all the time. Yeah. And then all the designs start looking the same. And you're like, why is this happening? Because you're using the same vendor all the time. So sometimes when you're organizing, if you just organize by a color or if you just organize by a type, then all the vendors get mixed up together. Now, any vendor out there that's listening to me is going to kill me because they're like, well, we want you to shop with us all the time. <laughs> right. But as designers, I think if we're looking to, you know, I mean, all designers have a style and a signature. But it's also nice to always be out there looking. And if you happen to come across something and go, oh, I don't know if this is still in stock or still available, which is key, anytime you pick something out of your library, sidebar, before you present it, make sure that it's still an available product. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> Too many times. Um and then that and then that might spur you to be on their website and go, oh, they have something new. So it really kind of helps you keep engaged because, again, we get so busy. Sometimes we forget to always go out there and look at the new items and look for new products and that type of thing. So that will help as well. The other fun fact is most people don't know this, but if you have a good rep, your rep will come clean your library. What? Yes. So in a lot of the commercial firms, we would call our reps and say, hey, come update us. And we would do that once a month and we would dedicate a certain day every month to vendors and the vendors would come in and make sure that our library was completely up to date. And I cannot tell you how many times I, I watched them throw away boxes <laughs> of stuff because we were forgetting to do that. Wow. So again, the reps don't want to do it, but they will because if they know that they're in there, that gives them the chance to get back in front of you so that you remember what their face looks like. So it's a little bit of a sales pitch for them as well. Nice tip. I love that. And then yeah. save, you don't have to get an intern. Just get the <laughs> You don't have to get an intern. <laughs> Just get the vendors in there for sure. Let's stick your vendors in there. Seriously. I mean, that's what they're there for. That's why they get paid. All right. So that's for the diehards that still want to keep a physical library. I'm not going to lie. That is kind of me. I do like to, I'm very tactile. I'm, I'm a Taurus and I really like to feel all the textures and stuff. So digitally for me, it's not as romantical. I don't get, but I, it is going that way and it saves a buttload of money. It really does. You don't have to have the space to do it. And it's just, and like you said, clients aren't resistant to it. And if there's something they really need to have in the hold, super easy to get. Digital libraries are the wave of the future with some exceptions with, uh, and uh, businesses like Material Bank are making bank because they really grabbed onto it, the trend of this, and they knew they knew what was up. All right, Rex, I think that's it for building your virtual library here for materials. Now I have to ask you if you're ready for the What Up Wingnut round. Hit me. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about that. Now it's time for What Up Wing Night. Wing Night. What would the hashtag on your tombstone be? Lived life. I like that. Okay, now I'm only going to ask you two of the three questions because I already know from your first interview you don't read books, which is, <laughs> which is capital S-A-D. So here you, here's the second one. You're stuck on a deserted island and can have only one of your favorite foods. What is it? Tacos. Nice. I like that answer. Tacos are great. Hey, last night was Taco Tuesday, and I make a killer non-meat taco. With what in it? Just all vegetables um, I use or a meat? Burger. How is that? I haven't tried it yet. Is it good? I love it. Almost anybody that I uh, know that's a carnivore eats it with no problem. Nom 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 nom. Okay, that's me. I'm a carnivore. I'm embarrassingly so. I was a vegetarian for a year back in the day, though. That's my one year of contribution to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rex, thanks again for joining us. Uh, good luck today with the clients. I'll be over here slaving away at Wingnut Social. So I miss you guys, and hopefully I can be back over there sometime before I die. <laughs> we miss you as well. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Rex Rogosh, for your tips on keeping a digital library. I mean, we do it by default because of just the nature of our business, and COVID has really forced our hand on that. How he described how he works is really how Darla Palantiri's works. I did want to mention one thing. I was going to say it during the interview, but I didn't have the opportunity there. When Rex was talking about how he's designed his libraries as a representative of who he is as a designer— I love that. To have just a little signature library to have off the cuff to show clients, you know, something small, something you can keep updated, something that isn't overwhelming, but that he went from a shirt in his closet 
And here's a little tip. If you're an interior designer and you're going to people's homes doing consultations and you're really struggling to find out what their style is or what their aesthetic is, their color palette, is just ask them if you can take a look in their closet and see what kind of clothes they wear. And regardless of what they think their style is, that's very revealing. The closet doesn't lie. If you see a lot of Birkenstocks <laughs> in there, I mean, you may want to you may want them to elevate their game, but uh, that's that's very telling. It's hard to get away from how you dress is kind of how you are. And as I'm saying that, I'm wearing my wingnut social t-shirt and pajama bottoms. So I don't know what that says about my design style, but there you have it. All right, guys, that's it for today. Go make sure you check out some of the resources we mentioned here at wingnutsocial.com. And if you like what you hear, leave us a review on whatever the hell you're listening to this podcast on. If you need help with marketing your luxury business, your high aesthetic business, or your interior design firm, go to wingnutsocial.com or give us a call at one eight seven seven wingnut We'd be happy to help you out. And that's it for today's show. Now go out there, get uncomfortable, and be great. You've reached the end of this episode of Wingnut Social, but that's only the first step into accelerating your business the Wingnut way. Head over to wingnutsocial.com or call us at 1-877-WINGNUT to see how we can help you take your business from social mediocre to social media master. We'll see you on the next episode of Wingnut Social, your social media tightly fastened. Do you still need a physical library? Do you still need a physical? Oh, Rex, did you do a wardrobe change? Well, no, in fact, Rex doesn't do caffeine, but maybe he should. All right, if guys, uh, that's it for today. Good boy, Mango.